to be a part of that. Now, I want to remind you also we have the children's church here on Sunday mornings. They, they go out of here after the singing is over with, so uh, keep that in mind for the kids, all right? I understand our 8- to 12-year-olds will be going back to the Little Grand Canyon on Saturday, November 14th, okay? So keep that in mind, and if anybody is wanting to go, and if you want your child to go, please get in touch with Ms. Vivian down here, and you can be a part of that. That's not far away now, November 14th, so uh, please keep that in mind. Also, we've got these Christmas boxes are what's left, I, I understand. If you see them sitting over here on this table, they don't need to be on this table. They need to be in your hands and being filled with toys and other good items that we can send off with the Samaritan's Purse organization and get to some kids who may not have Christmas otherwise. But also, not only will they get Christmas, they'll also get to hear the word of the Lord as, as that's given to them. And so that's a good thing. So I encourage you to pick those up before you leave if you would do that, okay? Now, at this time, I believe we've got a special recording. We are trying to get back to having the kids participate in the service and I understand these guys were a little hesitant to do this live, so we recorded them doing it. Is that all right? And we're going to show the recording. This is coming from Paul's class. Hold on just one second, Brian. Yes. Okay. Okay. And Okay. And Mandy's sitting over here. Maybe she can get that in the bulletin for next week. Okay. That's on the 14th from 6 to 8. We'll have a prayer vigil, okay? We're just going to roll this tape. If y'all want to come down and see it, you're welcome to do that, okay? This is coming from Mr. Paul's class. Now, guess what? Y'all are going to have to keep coming back each Sunday this month because there's going to be breaking news every Sunday this month. So if you want to get the news, you got to be here. All right? And that's a good thing. Did any of that sound familiar to you? Isn't that pretty pertinent? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I've got one more surprise and a real <coughs> great treat for you, especially during this election time. We have a very special guest here with us this morning. And I want to introduce to you the President of the United States, Mr. Donald J. Jax Trump. Can, can I ask you a question, Mr. President? Can you tell me your name? Say it. <laughs> Are you going to win this election? All right. <laughs> Wasn't that neat? <laughs> yeah, anybody needs a picture, get it now. 
I, I saw that this morning, and we had to do that. Now, that was the neatest thing I've seen in a while, okay? Y'all ready to sing this morning and praise the Lord? Well, let's stand and do that. Is that Leslie you're talking about? Oh, okay. Anybody else got a birthday this morning besides Leslie? She's already up here. <coughs> Anybody? <laughs> Wendell's is Wednesday. What is it, 62 Wendell? <laughs> All right, well, let's sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. We believe in God the Father, we believe 
Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back again. We believe. The law be bound and the dead be raised in the here and now. Let love invade. Let the church live loud. Our God will save. We believe. We believe. And the gates of hell will not prevail. For the power of God has torn the veil. Now we know your love will never fail. We believe. We believe. God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death, we believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back, He's coming back again.
Amen. I want to remind you before I get started this morning, I, I meant to do this early and it slipped my mind. Uh, that's not unusual these days. 
But the Bible marathon reading starts tomorrow from 7 to 7 each night through Saturday. And it'll be at the United Methodist Church here in Irwinton. We could not get the Union Church this year, so keep that in mind. It will be at the United Methodist Church, okay, if you go to read. And I hope you've signed up. If you haven't, you can see Jeff this morning. And I know, I believe there's some slots left, I'm pretty sure. And uh, be sure and, and do that if you can. And if anybody wants to come take my place Tuesday night and read First Chronicles, I'll let you have it. If you've ever read First Chronicles, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> No, that's all right. That's no problem. Basketball referee Al Covino was officiating a high school game in New York between New Rochelle and Yonkers. And Dan O'Brien was the coach of the New Rochelle team, who was the home team, and the game was close all the way to the buzzer. I mean, they fought back and forth the entire game. And with 30 seconds left, Yonkers led by one point. They missed a shot, and New Rochelle got the ball and brought it down the court. And the crowd at this time, as you can imagine, in one of those smaller gyms was going crazy and the sound was deafening and one of the uh, New Rochelle players shot the ball and it rolled around the rim and fell off and another guy just tapped it right back in and it looked like they had won the game and the referee looked at the clock and he could see that the time had run out but with so much noise he never heard the buzzer. He didn't know when the buzzer went off uh, during this, all of this shooting that was going on. And so he went over to the scorekeeper, who was a young man by about 17 years old, and the, the young man looked at him, and with a sad face, he said this. He said, Mr. Covino, the buzzer went off as the first ball rolled off the rim before the final tap-in was made. Now, he was the scorekeeper for the home team, remember. Corvino had to nullify the points, and he went over to tell Coach Bryan that instead of winning the game, he had actually lost it, and the game was over. Just about that time, as the coach was looking real crushed after he'd been so excited, this young 17-year-old young man or boy or whatever you want to call him came up to the coach and he said, I'm sorry, Dad. I had to tell the referee the time ran out before the last tap-in. Well, Coach O'Brien looked at his son and the hurt on his face just went away. And he said, don't worry about it, son. You did the right thing. You did what you had to do. I know some coaches that probably wouldn't go that direction. Can you imagine, though, the temptation that that young man faced in just a moment's time? He had to make a decision. He had to make a decision. And temptation can really have a real strong pull on us, can't it? How many of you have ever been tempted? Well, most of you are telling the truth. <laughs> Temptation is not always an easy thing to win over and to defeat because it can be attractive, can it? It, it can be some things that we really think we want to do. It's immediately satisfying and it pulls us away from what we know we ought to do and we give in to our fleshly desires sometimes by giving in to that temptation. And since the Garden of Eden, listen to me now, temptation has been the primary attack of Satan on Christians. So just because you come to know the Lord and you get saved, that doesn't mean he's going to leave you alone. That means he's probably going to get on your back more. That's what that means. And he's going to do all he can to entice you away from God and, and to get you doing things or saying things or acting in ways you ought not act. It doesn't matter who you are or how strong you are in the Lord, temptation is a real thing, and it can be tough. You know how I know that? Because Jesus was tempted. And I promise you there was nobody stronger in the Lord than Jesus Christ was while he walked on this earth. Sin has never been as easily accessible to us as it is today. All the technology has made what we call user-friendly. Temptation is user-friendly now. Did you know that? And it's so quick and so easy to get into it. It doesn't take long, does it? It doesn't take long at all. We must constantly, and the Bible tells us this over and over and over, we must constantly be on our guard. We must constantly be watchful, and as the Bible sometimes says, to be alert. 
That means we got to be prepared right here. That's where we got to prepare is in our minds. Someone has also said that temptation is like a rattlesnake, but I kind of tend to get, disagree, and I'm going to tell you why. If temptation were like a rattlesnake, I wouldn't have a problem with it, I'll be honest with you. It'd be easy for me to stay away from it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I just wouldn't be around it, all right? I'd be done with it, okay? But really and truly, it's not that way. Temptation is really an attractive thing. Temptation is like one of my favorites, coconut cake. It's like ice cream. Come on now. Now, I'm not saying anything's wrong with ice cream because I eat it all the time. But I'm just saying that's the way temptation presents itself is something you want, right? Something you desire and something like, you know, I feel like i got to have ice cream. You know what I mean? And that's the way temptation is. It's like a $100 bill laying there. It's like a good-looking man or a good-looking woman. It's like a new Lexus. It's like a corner office and all of those things that are good, we think. The idea is sin is attractive and temptation makes it look good to us. And I think that's the way Satan wants to present it to us. Why? So we'll fall into it. How many of you know, and I think I said this in Sunday school this morning, but how many of you know that if there's something you don't want to do, you don't like to do, Satan's not going to bother you with that? How many of you know that? If you don't like it and you don't want to do it, you're not going to be involved with that and it's not going to be tempting to you. So that's not where he hits us. He hits each one of us individually where we have the greatest desire to do something. That's where he gets us. How do we avoid temptation? Well, I'll tell you the easiest way to do it is stay away from it. If it does come around, run. Get away from it. The longer you hang around, the more the temptation is going to get a hold of you. The more you stay with it. It reminds me of the man who went to the doctor and and he told the doctor, he says, you know, I just broke my arm in two places. And the doctor said to him, well, then stay away from those two places. <laughs> Good answer for temptation, isn't it? If we know where it's coming and we know where our weaknesses are and we know where it's going to hit us, then stay away from those things that would tempt us and get in our way. We must decide to avoid it, avoid it and then we must use our wheels and push our wheels forward to stay away from it. I'm talking about W-I-L-L. J. Wilbur Chapman, an evangelist in the 1800s, gave us what I thought was a, a very clear picture of temptation. Here's what he said. Here's what he wrote. He said, it is the tempter looking through a keyhole into the room where you are living. Sin is your, your drawing, sin is your drawing back the bolt. You open it and make it possible for him to come in. So it takes an action on your part, doesn't it? Temptation is not the sin. We all know that, right? Temptation itself is not the sin. But he's looking at us, he's watching us, and he's looking for that opportunity for us just to open that bolt just enough so he can do what? Open the door and bring it in. Sadly, too many times we move the bolt back on and we let him in. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, a great verse for temptation. If you don't know it, you ought to memorize it. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. In other words, everybody goes through it. Everybody's been through the same temptations you've been through. Now, maybe different folks, different temptations, but somebody around has been through the same temptations you've been through. And God is faithful. There's the good part. Okay, If we want to be faithful, we've got to have God because he is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. It's not going to be anything that's going to come on you that you can't say no to. That's the point. You can say no to it. You can get away from it. The question is, will you? But he says, when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. In other words, you can stand strong and you can get through it without giving in to it. God has provided us every piece of equipment we need to win this battle. He's given us, remember, we talked about the belt of truth. Remember that? Ant right answers, yeah. <laughs> He's given us all these pieces of armor like the breastplate of righteousness we talked about recently, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, and the helmet of salvation. And we need all of these things and we need to clothe ourselves with all of these things every day to be able to defeat temptation and to be able to stand strong in the Lord. That's what we need. 
And all of these, if, if you look at them, are really defensive weapons to protect you from attacks coming in, right? Okay? But I want you to know in that same passage of Scripture in Ephesians 6, 17, the Lord has given us one offensive weapon to use. Amidst all these defensive weapons, he's given us one offensive weapon to use. And here it is. Verse 17 says, take the helmet of salvation, which we talked about earlier. And then he says, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What is the sword of the Spirit? The Word of God. Well, I want to break it down just a little bit closer for you this morning to help you understand exactly what he's talking about with this sword, or these swords, if you want to call them that, that we use to fight temptation. There's really no doubt as to what Paul is talking about here, is there? I mean, he, he makes it really clear. But let me explain it to you. And I got some of this from listening to David Jeremiah. Here's something that, that he said about this. It really made sense. He tells us there are two Greek words for the word, the word, when it's talking about the word in the Bible. Two Greek terms that are used for that. One is logos. You've heard that before, right? You've heard the word logos before which is the most commonly used term, and it's used to describe the Bible as a whole, all of it together, okay? So logos, when it uses the word logos, it's the whole Bible. Now, how many of you in here know that I, we probably haven't memorized the whole Bible? Anybody, anybody in here done that? No, I, I have not. Some of it, not nearly enough. The Bible as a whole is the Logos or the Word of God, but Logos is not the word that he uses right here in Ephesians, and that's why this is going to be important, what I'm about to tell you. It's the term Rema, R-H-E-M-A. The term Rema meaning word also. But it's more like this. It's a saying of God from his word. Did you get that? It's a saying of God from his Logos or word. Okay, the Rema, all right? And from that vast, comprehensive Word of God, we, in other words, we get scriptures or passages that we can use in times when we need them. But how many of you know that we got to know them to use them when we need them? Huh? Doesn't that make sense? If you don't know any of these passages, if you haven't put any of the Bible to memorization and you don't know it, how are you going to use it? How many of you carry your Bible around with you every day when you go? I know some of you got it on the phone. I understand that. But most of us don't carry a Bible everywhere we go. I mean, even sometimes if we think we are, we might forget it and leave it in the vehicle, hadn't we? Come on now. I mean, it happens. So this is important, what I'm telling you this morning. And it, you've, you've got to understand what this rhema is. Ray Stedman said this in Adventuring Through the Bible. I've got a copy of that at the house, and I really like it. He described Rima this way. He said, sometimes when you're reading a passage of script, the, the words seem suddenly just to come alive to you. Don't, have you ever done that? It takes on flesh and bones, he says, and it leaps off the page at you or grows eyes that follow you around wherever you go. I like the way he put that. You know, that, that scripture just kind of sticks with you, don't it? Or you develop a voice that echoes in your ears until you can't get away from it. In other words, you just keep hearing that scripture over and over and over. I think God does that for a reason. Because there are times when we may need that scripture. And if we go over it and over it and over it, guess what? It finally starts, even with the toughest of our heads, it starts sticking with us, don't it? Huh? So that's an important thing. He says, this echoing in, in, in your mind, this voice and this growing eyes and all this leaping off the page of this scripture, he says, this is the rhema of God. The sayings of God that strike home like arrows to the heart. They just hit you right here as you're reading them this is the sword of the spirit which is the word of God so here it is the Bible the logos is the word of God but the logos or the whole Bible is filled with swords <laughs> it's filled with passages of scripture that we can pull out and remember and use when Satan comes with his temptations and I got news for you, you got to understand something you're not going to defeat Satan or temptation without the Word of God. It's not going to happen. None of us are strong enough to stand on our own. How many of you know that? Everybody in here better get your hand up. We know that, right? Does this make sense? Huh? And it's the Word of God no matter what you say or think about it. You know, some people today are telling us the Word of God is nothing. Some are telling us it's a great prophetic book. Some are telling us it's just a great piece of literature. But I got news for you. It's the Word of God. I don't care what anybody thinks. And I don't care what they say. It is absolutely 
the Word of God, every bit of it, whether you read it or not, guess what? It's still the Word of God. Whether you ever get into it or not, it's still the Word of God. Nothing's going to change that. Now, let me give you an example of how this fighting temptation works, and we've got the greatest example we can have in the fourth chapter of Matthew in Scripture, and it's where Jesus is tempted. He, how many of you know he's our example for fighting temptation? I'm getting rid of it. I mean, he showed us how to do it. Now, here it is. He uses several swords or passages of Scripture when Satan is tempting him in Matthew 4. And, and we, we, I got a first note that Satan dropped all these temptations on him right after one of the highest highs in his life. You know what that was? How many of you remember what that was? It was when he was baptized. What happened when he was baptized? The heavens opened, God spoke, and the Spirit came down in the form of a dove. Now, that's good stuff. Huh? That's got to be a high, right? Right after that, the Spirit leads him into the wilderness, and it says this in Matthew chapter 3. It says this, in Matthew chapter 3 and 16, I want to tell you this. God said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now, that's pretty much affirmation, isn't it? Okay? Then he goes on in chapter 4, verse 4, and he says this. He said, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. Why was he led into the Spirit to the wilderness? To be tempted for that purpose. Why, do you think? so that we would have a means of understanding how we can defeat temptation, so we can see how he did it and understand that he was victorious so we could do the same thing. So why don't we do the same thing? Good question, huh? Verse 2 says, After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now, how many of you know he was actually hungry because he was human? Don't tell me he was God and he wasn't hungry. He was hungry. He says, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered. What did he say? It is written. Where is it written? In God's word. This is God's word. He said, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. How do we live? What do we live on? The word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil, verse 5, took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. He says, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift up in their hands, they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Isn't that interesting? Did Satan know scripture? Yeah, he did. Jesus answered him, it is also written. <laughs> now you gotta, you gotta love it. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. So you can't always just pull out one verse and say this is the whole gospel. You've got to put it together. Okay? Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. He said, all of this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written. Third time. There it is, third time. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And when he told him the third time what happened, the devil left him and what? Angels came and ministered to him. Now, why did the angels need to come and minister to him? Because these were real temptations for one reason. Because he had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights and he was tired and he was hungry. He needed help. And so they came and ministered to him. How many of you know that you got angels guarding you? Do you believe that? That's what the Bible says. You have angels guarding you, and when you need them, they are there. You don't have to do it by yourself. That is good stuff. Thank you, Vicki. Satan appealed first to the lust of the flesh, didn't he? Eating that bread, <laughs> getting his physical taken care of. And he asked Jesus to perform a miracle on his own. And, and this is the really bad part of it. He was asking him to perform this miracle on his own without the approval of the Father. Did you get that? That's what he was doing. And he wanted Jesus to satisfy his human hunger by stepping outside of God's will. That, that's what was wrong with him. That's why this was a temptation. He was hungry. What did Jesus do? He quoted Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Deuteronomy. How many of you have read Deuteronomy recently? And it says, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. That's what Jesus quoted. He quoted what? Scripture. Jesus was telling Satan that feeding on God's word 
And obeying him was much more important than satisfying his own physical needs. That's what he was saying. How many of us put that first? Good question. The next thing, Satan appealed to the lust of his eyes, didn't he? What he could see and what was out there in front of him. And it looked good. I mean, he was giving him, he said, I'll give you the world. I'll give you whatever you can see. And he was on this pinnacle of this temple. And Satan even quoted scripture, didn't he? When he said he'll command his angels to come and take charge of you and, and keep you, you know. He left out the part that says to guard you in all your ways. but Meaning to make us do the right thing, to keep us doing the right thing, right? He left that part out. This temptation actually took place about 450 feet above the Kidron Valley. That's a pretty high place, isn't it? Think of a 45-foot story building today. If it's about 10 feet per story, think of that. If that helps you picture it. In this temptation, Satan was trying to get Jesus to force God to do something. I mean, if he jumped off the building and he's God's son, God would what? Save him, you think? I'm not sure if he would have or not. I don't know. It doesn't tell us that, okay? But that's what Satan had in mind. Force God into doing something against what he's already ordained. That's what he's saying, okay? Jesus answered him again by quoting Deuteronomy 6.16. There's that book again. Do not let put the Lord your God to the test. That was his sword or his rema for that particular temptation. Not the whole Bible, but he pulled out one sword. And he put it right in Satan's heart. <laughs> Finally, Satan tried to appeal to his pride. He took him up on a high mountain and showed him the world and told Jesus he would give him everything if Jesus would just fall down and worship him. All he had to do was just kneel down and worship Satan. That was it. That wouldn't take much effort, would it? Remember that by the Bible calls Satan the prince of this world. You remember reading that? He's the prince of this world. That means he's a power in this world. Now we know that Jesus certainly was going to inherit all things because God had already promised that to him, had he not? He had already told him that he was going to inherit all things. But that time was a long way down the road, so that's why it would be a temptation to Christ. He could get it now according to Satan. That's what Satan was offering him. But once again, what would that be? That was not God's will. That was not God's plan. God sent Jesus to this earth the first time for a very specific reason, and it wasn't to conquer the world, not militarily. He sent him to die on a cross for our sins. That was God's plan. Satan's trying to do what? Think about it. Now, what if, if Jesus had yielded to any one of these temptations? Where would the cross be? What good would the cross be to you? None. We'd all be dead in our sin. There would be no hope. I wonder sometimes, as we give in to temptation, how we're affecting other people and if we're hurting them spiritually where they won't get to the Lord. Huh? Come on now. That's serious stuff. That's serious stuff. Jesus used another sword, this time from Deuteronomy 6.13, said, Fear or worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And guess what? That was it. That was the end of it. That was the end of it. Satan had to go. He couldn't handle it anymore. Jesus used scripture three times against three specific temptations, and he won every one of them because he leaned on the word of God. He knew the word of God, and he pulled that sword out when he needed it, and he used it. That's how it's done. That is how we have victory over temptation, folks. It's not rocket science. That's just it. We use God's word. To do this, we must be in the Word. Makes sense, right? We must be in the Word. We must be learning the Word. And we must be getting swords to use when we need them on the spur of the moment. And that's the way temptation works sometimes. Satan's going to attack you. you got to have something to drive him away. You've got to have some equipment, something to do. And he's given us the sword of the spirit, these remas that we've been talking about. Well, it's not really, it's getting a little harder for me to memorize scripture, but I can still do it. If I can do it, anybody can do it. Okay? It just takes some time. You get that? It just takes some time. We might need to read it over and over. 
Somebody suggested that if you read a verse over and over 50 times, even if it's over a few days, it'll start sticking with you. And then it'll become easier to memorize. Maybe that's what we need to do. Maybe you need to record it and listen to it. Did you know there are apps you can get now to help you memorize Scripture? I've got one on my phone. It's called Verse Locker. You ought to try it. I mean, you just put the Scripture. You can put in any Scripture in that you want. And then you just hit the button, and it'll say it over and over and over until you hit the button again and turn it off. I've, I've memorized some Scripture that way. It's a good way to do it. How many of you know that hearing the thing over and over, you can learn it? Listen. <laughs> Satan is out to get you. Okay? That's the bottom line. He wants you dead. He wants you destroyed. And he knows that sin will destroy you if you let it get a hold of you. Remember, you are a child of the king. <laughs> and he's in charge. And he's all powerful. I remember reading the story of King Louis who was the son of King Louis XVI of France. This was King Louis Charles Bourbon was his name. And uh, this other king, his father's name and his mother's name was Marie Antoinette. Y'all may remember that name from your history, very familiar family. And when he was four years old, the French Revolution broke out and they began, you know, killing the aristocrats and cutting their heads off and doing all of this. And they arrested his father, the king, and his mother and they put him in prison in Paris and later on or just a couple of years later they guillotined him there in Paris his mother and his father both and actually in the eyes of those who believed in the royalty that made him king at that point right if he was the next in line and the son of the king even though he was very young and it's an, it was an interesting thing that those who took over the government and they didn't kill him they didn't put him to death like they did his mother and father very unusual things because usually if you wanted to get rid of the king and his family you just wiped out the whole family if you wanted to get rid of that royal line that's what you did okay but they didn't do that they put him in prison and what they tried to do was they they tried to put all these temptations in front of him so they could say aha look what your king did so that they could discredit him in front of the people so they offered him all these temptations over a number of days uh, trying to discredit him and they exposed him to about every kind of temptation that you could they gave him all these rich foods and all and presented them to him so uh, they could make him a slave to his appetite at least that's what they thought that's what they wanted to do they constantly used foul language in front of him so he would develop that habit of speaking that way and I mean who wants to listen to that all the time huh they thought that would discredit him in front of the people and then they did all these other things trying to get him to do that but he never yielded to any of it he never yielded to the first temptation he stood strong against all of that and they finally got fed up with it I guess and gave up and they asked him why he did not partake of all these pleasures and all these things that they had offered him and here's what he said he said I cannot do what you ask because I was born to be a king how many of you know you're born to be a king or a queen because the Bible says Listen to it in 2 Timothy 2.12. It says, if we endure, in other words, if we stand strong and resist temptation, we shall reign with him. Now, who reigns? A king and a queen. Okay? You're born to the king, to be a king or queen. Okay? What, this is a good question, listen to it. What earthly temptation can measure up to that? What is so important that you want to do that it's that important? You got the answer. Somebody said it. Nothing. That's exactly right. Nothing. Here it is. Keith, you can come as I close here. I want to encourage you this morning to really work, if you haven't already, on growing in your relationship with Jesus Christ. This is serious. This is the way to be strong. This is the way to be obedient. And this is the way to stand strong in the face of temptation. Is if you have a strong relationship with God. And the, where we need to start with that is in the word of God. I do want to encourage you to read it. I want to encourage you to meditate on it and think about it. I want to encourage you to go over it and over it. I want to encourage you to take some of those remas, some of those verses out, some of those swords out. And I want to encourage you to start memorizing them if you haven't already done that. If you haven't memorized ever a verse of Scripture, you're really missing it. 
I, I'm telling you, you're missing it. And you're going to have a hard time standing strong when Satan comes. You've got to put it away in here <laughs> so it affects what's here. Okay? Remember this, and I close with this. Psalm 119.11. You might want to start memorizing this verse. It says, Your word I have hidden my heart that I might not sin against you. <laughs> That's how you beat temptation. That's it. Would you stand? This altar is open if you need to come and pray. I, 